Welcome to lecture number three in the multiple antenna communications at Linköping University. This lecture will be dedicated to multipath propagation and Rayleigh fading. And we will look at two categories of fading channels. Slow fading, where we will talk about outage probability, outage capacity, and spatial diversity. And then another category called fast fading, where we will introduce the concept of ergodic capacity and talk about channel hardening. The last lecture was about line of sight communications where the signal finds its way from a transmitter to a receiver via a direct path between them. However, now we will look at the opposite scenario where the line of sight path is blocked by some object. And in those cases, there are still other propagation paths that are important to model, even if they would be much weaker than the line of sight path is when it exists. And in particular, there is the phenomenon of scattering, where a signal from transmitter reaches an object and then it's getting spread out in many directions. And there is a good chance that at least one of those many directions is taking you towards the receiver. And when you have one object that scatters the signal towards the receiver, there is often many such objects in the same environment. Each one of them will have a propagation path that is slightly different. So if we measure the total length, we have D1, D2, DI for the ith path, and D capital L if we have capital L different paths. So the received signal will be the combination of the signals from these L paths. So we can write the channel G as a summation over L different paths. And each of them have two parts. One path that describes how strong the signal is, and one that is describing the phase shift or equivalently the time delay. So alpha i here is describing the channel gain of the ith path, and then we have e to the power of minus j, 2 pi, and di minus d divided by lambda. This is describing the time delay or phase shift. So di is the distance of the ith path, d is the reference distance, which is selected based on when you are taking your samples and lambda is the wavelength. And this is telling you how far off you will be in terms of your time delay or phase shift uh, when you're taking your samples. And the important thing here is that we have many different paths. And they might have similar channel gains, but the phases are always very different. So here's an example of that. Say that all of the channel gains are one divided by L. So we are normalized with the number of paths. And theta i, which is the phase shift, was equal to 2 pi di minus d divided by lambda. And the wavelength lambda is usually very small compared to the propagation paths. And uh, for that reason, the phases are changing very rapidly depending on what kind of length you have in your path. And therefore, it makes good sense to model it as being a random variable, which has a uniform distribution between 0 and 2 pi, because those are the only phase shifts that are important. If you get something large than 2 pi or small than 0, we can wrap it into that interval again. And let's now look at the channel magnitude, which is this summation over the different paths. And we had square root of the channel gain, which was 1 divided by L. And then you have e to the power minus j theta i, where theta i was our phase shift. And depending on which value you have on theta i, these different paths here will either add up constructively or cancel out each other if you have phases that are in opposite directions. And let's look at the magnitude. We take the absolute value of that, and that's the magnitude of the channel G. Here we are showing the cumulative distribution function of G, which means that if we take a value x here on the horizontal axis, then on the vertical axis we are showing the probability that the absolute value of G is smaller than x. So this is a way of characterizing the probability density function is essentially the integral of it for a given value here. And if we are having two paths with different phases that are independent, then we are getting a cumulative distribution function, which is the dashed line here. If we have eight paths, we get a red line. And then we have the blue line, which is very close to the red one. And this one is achieved when we approximate G as being complex Gaussian, with zero mean and variance one. And this is also called Rayleigh fading, and we will come back to that. But the point is that it's a very good approximation. As soon as we have, say, five, six, seven, eight, or more paths than that, then Rayleigh fading is appearing naturally. 
and therefore it's a very common way of modeling real propagation channel in a random way. A more concrete motivation behind this Rayleigh fading model can be achieved using something called the central limit theorem. And this one is saying that let x1, x2 up to xl be a sequence of l real valued, independent and identically distributed random variables. And they could have essentially any distribution here as long as they are having the same one and that they are independent realizations. Then they should have zero mean and the common variance sigma square. Then as the number of elements in this sequence L goes to infinity, then if we take the sum of them and then we are in front of the summation we are dividing with the number of elements and the variance and we take the square root of that, then this converges to a standard Gaussian distribution uh, which is real valued and have zero mean and variance one. So this normalization here is making sure that we get the variance equal to one. This theorem is motivating why we are seeing this normal or Gaussian distribution in a lot of different scenarios in practice, including wireless communications. In our case, the sequence of L random variables will represent our L propagation path. And let's now assume what we call rich multipath propagation, where we have a very large number of paths. Then we will get a Gaussian distribution. And actually we are considering complex value channels where we have a real part and an imaginary part. And those parts are uncorrelated, and therefore we can apply the central limit theorem separately on each of them and get a complex Gaussian distribution with zero mean and variance, which I will call beta. And as we saw, it's enough to have, say, eight paths or so before this becomes a very good approximation of a practical channel. The reason that we call it Rayleigh fading is that if we look at the absolute value of G, when G is distributed according to a complex Gaussian distribution, then the absolute value has a Rayleigh distribution, which is a distribution that we are not hearing so much about in other situations, but it has a certain probability density function, and in this case it has a parameter that you put into that PDF and you get a square root of beta divided by two. That is what you put into it. To show you how it looks like, let's consider the case when you have a standard complex Gaussian distribution with a variance equal to one. Well then, the absolute value of G will be really distributed with one divided by square root of two as the parameter that you put into that distribution. And that gives us this probability density function of absolute value of G. The way of interpreting this random distribution is that the absolute value of G is varying depending on the channel realization between zero and maybe up to three. And it has this distribution form where most of the realizations are relatively close to one. The reason that we call it fading becomes clear if we are changing the scaling on the horizontal axis. So let's do that. Here is zooming in on the tail by having a logarithmic scale on the horizontal axis. So here is the one, and I said before that many of the realizations are close to one. And in those cases, we can say that we have quite a good channel. It's close to its average value. However, we can also see that there is a substantial probability of being down here where the channel is very close to zero. So with probability 0 0.2, we are down at 0 0.1. And with the probability of a few percent here, we are down at 0 0.01. So in those cases, we say that the channel is in deep fade because it's very close to zero. There are two issues with channel fading. One of them is that we get a large variation in channel quality. So sometimes the channel is good and sometimes it's bad. And the other problem is that this is happening in an unpredictable manner. So it's very hard to deal with this in your transmissions. The main purpose of this lecture is to characterize the capacity of fading channels. So let's look at an additive white Gaussian noise channel with a random channel response G of L, where L is a time index. So the received signal at time index L is this channel response multiplied with the transmitted signal, which is complex Gaussian distributed and has Q as its energy per sample. So that's the same type of information signals as we have considered previously. And then we add noise, NL, which is independent for different time indices L, and it's complex Gaussian distributed, and not is the variance. And we will consider two categories of channels. One is 
called slow fading and that is when g of l takes one random realization and it keeps that value throughout the entire transmission. So if we have a transmission with a certain block length then the fading is very slow compared to that length so it's approximately the same realization throughout that block. The other option is fast fading where g of l is taking many different realizations. Uh, essentially it takes all realization during our transmission because the channel block is very long while the variations of the channel are very fast. So these are two categories I will consider. In reality we might be somewhere in between these two different categories but by studying these two extremes we will understand the two different ways that fading channels can behave. So let's start with the slow fading channel. Y of L is then G which doesn't have any time index anymore, time to transmit the signal plus noise. And G of L has one random realization through the entire transmission. And the assumption we're making now is that the receiver knows G. It's observed the channel many times and therefore it can learn it. There is, for example, a concept of sending known signals known as pilots in order to learn them. But we are not caring so much about that part now. We just assume that the receiver knows G. However, the transmitter doesn't know G. So that is the issue that we need to deal with when we are communicating over a slow fading channel. The transmitter doesn't know the channel. The receiver, however, knows the realization of G, so he can compute the capacity CG, which is log 2 or 1 plus the absolute value square of the channel response G, times an SNR, and we will reduce this form SNR, which is Q divided by N0, just to simplify the notation. And even if this is the capacity of the channel, the transmitter doesn't know C of G because it doesn't know the realization G. And therefore it cannot encode the data in such a way that we can achieve this capacity. And that is the interesting part here. What can we do instead? Well, the transmitter can do an opportunistic transmission, which means that it guesses on a certain rate, R bits per second per hertz or R bit per symbol. And the transmitter is then encoding the signal as if this was the capacity. There are then two different things that can happen depending on the realization of the channel G when R is not dependent on G. So one option is that R happened to be smaller than CG. So then we are communicating at a rate which is below the capacity and we have encoded the signal in the right way so then we will have a successful transmission. So if we are just sending a large enough block of data we can achieve a transmission which is without any errors at all. So that is the channel capacity theorems. The other option is that we are selecting R, which is greater than the capacity CG. And in those cases, we are not satisfying our channel capacity results. We're trying to communicate fast on that. And we know that that will only lead to large error probabilities. And the larger the blocks are, the more certain we can be that the communication will fail. And in those cases, we say that the system is in outage. So we have an outage when R is greater than CG for a given realization of the channel. And we can characterize the outage probability for a certain rate R. So that is the probability that we given this R happen to be in outage. We call it P out and it's a function of the rate R. And it's the probability that CG is smaller than R. And CG was log 2 or 1 plus the absolute value square of the channel times the SNR. So we have this expression like this. This is the outage probability for rate R. And if we now assume that G is complex Gaussian and have the variance 1, because we have put everything else into the SNR to describe which signal to noise ratio we are having, then the outage probability for rate R which had this type of shape, can be computed exactly using the distribution of G. If we take the absolute value square of G, we have an exponential distribution. If we take the absolute value of G, we have a Rayleigh distribution. And those different cases can be used to compute the probability. We get 1 minus e to the power of minus 2 to the power of R minus 1 divided by S and R. This is what we are getting. And the way that we are getting this is that we can draw a probability density function over the capacity CG that we're getting. So it has this shape, certain values around one here is much more certain than others. And then we pick a value R. This is the rate that we're communicating with. And everything that is underneath the curve here, this area, the shaded area, that is the outage probability. That is the probability that the channel 
is uh, giving us a CG that is smaller than R. And the larger R is, the larger the uh, area under the curve is going to be uh, where we have an outage. And what we are really interested in is communicating when we have high signal to noise ratio. And in those cases, we can use a Taylor expansion, uh, which is accurate when the SNR is very large, so that this e to the power of minus something, this something here is close to zero, which happens when the SNR is large. And in those cases, after you have applied your Taylor expansion, you get 2 to the power of r minus 1 divided by SNR. So you get this exponent here. And this is the interesting thing here. The outage probability at high SNR will be inversely proportional to the sink to noise ratio. Uh, so that is happening in this type of single antenna channels. Another way of looking at this is in terms of what is called the outage capacity. So what is the difference here from the additive white Gaussian noise channel? Well, from the expression that we had before, we could see that it's only when r is equal to zero that we can guarantee zero error probability. And for that reason, the capacity is strictly speaking equal to zero, because that's the only rate we can select such that we are guaranteed to always have zero error probability. But we don't want the uh, rate to be zero or the capacity to be zero. We can't communicate. So therefore, for slow fading channel, we can define something else that we call the epsilon outage capacity. So that is the largest rate r that we can communicate with, such that the outage probability is smaller or equal to epsilon. And we always get equality here when we try to make it as large as possible. So the interpretation here is that with probability 1 minus epsilon, we can communicate perfectly c epsilon is the capacity and we get zero error probability. But part of the time the communication will fail, and that part of the time is probability epsilon. And you can play around with the expressions and find an expression when you have Rayleigh fading uh, where we have C epsilon, the epsilon outage capacity, being log 2 or 1 plus the SNR times the ln, which is the natural logarithm, of 1 minus epsilon to the power of minus 1. And if we would have had an additive white Gaussian noise channel, then this logarithm here will be replaced by 1. So that is where the difference from an additive white Gaussian noise channel shows up. And if epsilon is very small, then we put in the small number here, we get something that is close to 1, we take 1 over that one, we get something that still is close to 1, and the ln of 1 is 0. So in that case we have essentially as NR times 0, so we get very very low uh, epsilon outage capacity. While if epsilon is large, so it's close to 1, then we have something here that is 1 divided by something small, we get a large number and then we are actually beating the additive white course in noise channel. This figure is showing the relationship with the outage probability being shown on the horizontal axis and the epsilon outage capacity on the vertical axis. We are considering an SNR of 0 dB and we have the additive white course in noise channel as a reference. And in that case we get 1 bit per second per hertz as the capacity, so that's the reason for this straight line. And what we can see with the epsilon outage capacity is that it is small when epsilon is small and it is large when epsilon is large, so it's an increasing function. So that means that the larger probability of outage that we can live with, the higher the epsilon outage capacity is going to be. And there is a point when the two lines are crossing, that is when epsilon is equal to 1 minus e to the power of minus 1. If we can live with a very high outage probability, we can use the fading channel only when it has a good fading realization, when we are up here, and in those cases we can beat the outer white course and noise channel. However, it's usually for very low outage probabilities where we want to operate. So since we're only going to transmit one block or so, we will like it to go through with a very high probability, say 95% or something like that. And then we will be down here when you see that the epsilon outage capacity is far from the capacity of an additive white course and noise channel. Here is another way of illustrating that. So now we are looking at the fraction of the additive white course and noise capacity that we can achieve over this Rayleigh fading channel. So it's the capacity of the Rayleigh fading case 
divided by the capacity of the anti-white Gaussian noise channel. And this is now the epsilon out capacity, so we will consider different values of epsilon, namely 0 0.1 and 0 0.01. If the fraction is equal to 1, we will get the same performance with both the fading channel and the non-fading channel. But we see that that is never happening here. So when we have lowest now, we only get a very small fraction of the additive white Gaussian noise channel capacity. At higher SNRs, we can see that, well, then we get a larger fraction. But if we would like to have 0 0.01 as our epsilon, then we are still never much more than 60% or so. And these will converge to values that are below 1. So the outage capacity is usually quite small as compared to the IT white course and noise channels capacity. So can we improve the situation somehow? Yes, we can. And that is where multiple antennas are coming into the picture. So let us consider now a fading multiple antenna channel. We are focusing on the case where we have one transmit antenna and we have multiple receive antennas. We have M of them. And the line of sight path is still being blocked and the receiver array is surrounded by scattering objects. So it's inside a rich scattering environment. In those cases, there is a model called the independent identical distributed Rayleigh fading model where the channel vector G is complex Gaussian, have zero mean, it has beta as its variance, and the covariance matrix is an identity matrix, which means that all of the channel components are having this complex Gaussian distribution with beta as its variance, and they're independent of each other. And it's not necessary that they will be independent, even if each of the different channels will by itself be modeled in the same way as we described before. But it's only in special cases when they become independent. And one example of that is when we have a uniform linear array with half wavelength spacing. So that was one case we have talked about before. And in those cases, if we are really surrounded with scattering objects, then you will get independent and identically distributed Rayleigh fading in those cases. And when that is the case, the squared norm of the channel, which is something that shows up in our conventional capacity expression when we have a non-fading channel, that one have a distribution which is closely related to what is known as the chi-square distribution. Here is the probability density function. If we have M receive antennas and ID Rayleigh fading, then we can formulate the outage probability in the same way as before. So P out for a certain rate R, that is probability that R is greater than the capacity that we will get for a particular realization of a channel vector G. And that is log 201 plus the square norm of G times the SNR. And this is where the probability density function becomes helpful because what this really means is that we should take the probability density function we should integrate it from 0 up to 2r minus 1 divided by s and r. That is what you get in this type of expression if you rearrange so that we get the square norm of g by itself on one side and everything else on the other side. Then we will get 2r minus 1 divided by s and r on that other side. And this is also showing that this is the way that we are computing the outer probability. We take the PDF and we integrate from 0 up to a value determined by which value on R that we are selecting. We can plug in the PDF from the previous slide and compute this integral and there is a, a closed form expression but it's quite ugly, it doesn't provide us with much insights. So just as before we will look at the high SNR case where we can simplify the PDF and after doing some simplification one can compute the integral and this is the expression that we get. 1 divided by m factorial, and this is the actually the least important part. This is the important part. 2 to the power of r minus 1 divided by s and r, and then this whole thing to the power of m. And if you remember, we had the same type of result with m equal to 1 before. Then the exponent went away, and this 1 divided by m factorial is also going away. What we observed before was that the outage probability goes down as 1 divided by the SNR. And now we have 1 divided by the SNR to the power of m. So this is representing a so-called spatial diversity gain. 
the algebra probability goes down much more quickly because of the exponent m. And we say that we have a diversity order of m in these type of cases. Here is an illustration of that where we look at the algebra probability with m receive antennas and m is going to be equal to 1, 2, or 4. And this is represented by this curve with m is equal to 1, this curve with m is equal to 2, and this curve with m equal to 4. As I said before, the outer probability should go down as the SNR to the power minus m when the SNR is large. And when we are showing the outer probability here in the logarithmic scale and the SNR also in logarithmic scale, that means that we should see a linear behavior with different slopes. Minus 1, which is the exponent when m is equal to 1, minus 2, which is the exponent when we have m equal to 2, and the exponent of minus 4 uh, gives us a slope of minus 4. So for every 10 decibel that we are increasing, we are going down by a factor 10 when we have m equal to 1. So that is what happens when the SNR goes down as SNR to the power minus 1. When we are instead considering the case when we have m equal to 2, then for every 10 decibel that we are moving horizontally, we should go down by a factor 100 vertically. So the outer probability goes down by a lot. And it goes down even faster when m is equal to 4, then 10 decibel of improvement will lead to a 10,000 times smaller Altish probability. And there are two different effects that plays a role here. One of them is the beam forming gain. So that's when we have m receive antennas and therefore collect m times more power. And then we also have the diversity gain. And that is what plays the role here in addition, namely that the risk that all of these m antennas will simultaneously have a bad fading realization becomes smaller and smaller. And that is why we are getting this slope here. So the beam forming gain is moving curves to the left and the diversity gain is giving us a better slope. We will now move on to the second category of fading channels, namely those that are subject to fast fading. In this case, the received signal Y of L is equal to a channel response g of l times x of l, which is transmitted signal, plus the noise n of l. So it's the same model as before, but the main difference is how this channel is modeled. So in this case, we will get one realization of the channel, g l, for each time index l. Or potentially, it will have the same realization for a few different time indices, but then it will change. And this is what we call block fading, when for one finite sized block of transmission symbols, we have one realization of a channel, then we get a new one for the next block, and a new one, and so on, and every time we get an independent realization. The result that we will derive now will be the same if G of L is fixed for just one symbol or for a finite sized block of symbols. So for simplicity, we will consider that they are changing from every time index, just to keep it simple. The important thing is that every realization is independently drawn from a so-called ergodic process, which means that when we look at sufficiently long sequence of channel realizations, we will see all types of channel realizations that exist. So we are sort of exploring the entire probability density function. And what can we do in a system like this when the transmitter is still not knowing the channel? Well, the transmitter can select a rate R just as before, and then it can opportunistically transmit using that rate by encoding information. Let's assume first that we see L different blocks of channel realizations, G1, G2, up to GL. Then reliable communication will happen if the summation over the capacitor that we are getting for the different channel realizations, which are log 2 of 1 plus the SNR times the absolute value square of a particular channel realization, GL. If we sum that up, then we will like it to be larger than L times the rate R that we are transmitting at. So that's the number of bits over these L channel realizations. When the inequality holds, then there won't be any outage. And if we rearrange here, we divide by L on both sides, we can write this as 
r being smaller than 1 divided by l and then this summation over the log 1 plus s and r multiplied with the absolute value square of the channel realizations. So when we have many channel realizations so that we are summing up over all of them and we divide with the number of them then this is actually an averaging of the log 2 or 1 plus s and r times absolute value square of the channel and then this averaging will turn into a statistical expectation when we have this kind of ergodic fading channels. So we will get the same thing here, log 2 or 1 plus the absolute value square of the channel and then times the SNR but we will have an expectation instead of the summation and division with the number of realizations. That's what happens when we let L go to infinity. And this mean value is now with respect to the different channel fading realizations. And we call this the ergodic capacity. And that is because we have log 2 or 1 plus something random. And then we have expectation with respect to that randomness. And to point out that this is something different than the capacity we get with a non-fading channel, we call it ergodic capacity. This value doesn't depend on a particular realization of channel G, but on the average in here. So it's a deterministic number. Therefore, the transmitter knows this value, even if it doesn't know the channel. So therefore, it can easily select R to be small or equal to this number. And therefore, the outage problems doesn't appear anymore in fast fading channel. We can extend the ergodic capacity concept to the case when we have multiple receive antennas. So in the SIMO case, we know that we would get log 2 or 1 plus the square norm of the channel vector times the SNR. And that's what we will have as the capacity if we have a non-fading channel. And now when we have a fast fading channel, we get the expectation of the same thing. And the expectation is computed with respect to different realizations of the channel vector. Let's now compare the performance that we will get with an additive white Gaussian noise channel. And in particular, we will assume that we have the same SNR. So if we start with the case with only one transmit and one receive antenna, then with an additive white Gaussian noise channel, we will have log 2 or 1 plus the SNR. And with the corresponding Rayleigh fading additive white Gaussian noise channel, we will have log 2 or 1 plus the absolute value square of one realization channel times the same as an R and G will now be having variance one. And then we have an expectation with respect to that randomness. And here in the figure, we are showing on the vertical axis, the rate in bit per symbol that we can achieve for the non-fading or the Rayleigh fading channel. And here we show the signal to noise ratio that is varying. The black curve is for the non-fading case and the red curve is for the Rayleigh fading case. And what we can observe is that if we are at low sync to noise ratios, then it doesn't really matter if we have a additive white Gaussian noise channel that is non-fading or a Rayleigh fading channel. The reason for that is that a logarithm behaves as a linear function when you have a low value on the SNR. So we can take that one away, we can move the expectation onto this absolute value square of the channel, replace it with a one, then we will get the same result as before. Another way of viewing that is that the channel is sometimes better than the average and sometimes it's worse. And at lower than R, those two effects are canceling out each other. The story is different when we are up at high as R. Then there is a gap at high as R that can be computed to be approximately equal to 0 0.83 bit per symbol. What is the reason for this performance difference? Well, that is that the logarithm is a slowly increasing function. And if the channel sometimes is better than the average or sometimes worse, we will lose more when it's worse than we will gain back when it is higher than the average. And therefore we get this type of loss. We can compensate for this performance loss by using multiple receive antennas. And before we go into detail on that, I will first introduce something called Jensen's inequality, which is applied to concave functions. And this is saying that when we have a random variable set and a concave function f, and if we have an expectation of this concave function of a set, then the value will be smaller or equal to when we are interchanging the order of this computation. So if you take the uh, concave function of the expectation of set, 
Why do I talk about this? Well, that's because the logarithm is a concave function. And in more general, a function is concave if any line between two points on the curve is below the curve. So here is an illustration of that where I'm showing f of z, which is now log 2 of 1 plus z. So if z is the signal to noise ratio, including the fading channel, well, then this is the behavior there. And you can see that as we are varying z, we are getting a concave function because if we pick two different points on this curve and draw a line between them, we will always be below the curve. Another function that is concave is minus log 2 of 1 plus 1 over z. So there are two different things that are different. We have instead of z, 1 divided by z, and we have a minus in front of the logarithm. And by the way, another way of proving that something is concave, instead of drawing lines between two points on a curve is to take the second derivative of a function and show that it's always negative. Then we have a concave function. We will use the answer inequality with both of these functions in order to compute lower and upper bounds on the ergodic capacity for a Simon channel. And it goes like this. Here we have the expected value of log 2 of 1 plus the squared norm of the channel g times s and r. And if we let z be equal to the squared norm times the s and r, then we can apply Jensen inequality to move this expectation inside of the logarithm and get the expected value of the square norm and the SNR, but the SNR is deterministic, so we can move it outside of the expectation. So this is Jensen inequality with f of z equal to log 2 or 1 plus z. Alternatively, we can use Jensen inequality in the opposite order. So in that case, we'll let z be equal to 1 divided by the squared norm of g to the power minus 2, and then we move the expectation to the inside to get this type of expression. And then we have this minus sign in front of the logarithm when we apply Jensen inequality. And that is switching the direction of the inequality. So we get a lower bound instead. So the lower bound is log 2 or 1 plus the SNR divided with the expected value of the norm of g to the power minus 2. And this is something that applies to any fading distribution. A lot of those things I've been talking about in this video applies to general fading distributions, but we are mostly interested in Rayleigh fading. If we have ID Rayleigh fading, so each element of G is independent and identically distributed, and it has a complex Gaussian distribution with variance 1, then we can compute these two expectations exactly. The expected value of the squared norm of G is just to sum up the variance of all the M elements in G, which is then giving us an M. And there is also a result that is showing that if we have the norm of G to the power of minus 2 and we compute the expected value of that, we will get 1 divided by M minus 1. And then we have an inverse, so we get M minus 1. We have now a chain of inequality that is saying that the ergodic capacity of a Simon channel is smaller than something and greater than something. And this is actually what we will get with a non-fading add to white Gaussian noise channel, where we in the upper bound have m antennas and in the lower bound have m minus one antennas. So we are sort of in between having the same antennas that we're having and having one antenna less. And here is a comparison of these three different cases. The ergodic capacity is the red line in the middle. The upper bound is what we are getting with an additive white Gaussian noise channel with the same number of antennas. And the blue curve is what we are getting with an additive white Gaussian noise channel with one antenna less. So what we are showing is the rate in bits per symbol versus the number of antennas. And when we only have one antenna, there is a big gap. Actually, lower bound is equal to zero. And uh, there is anyway a gap between the upper bound and the ergodic capacity. And as we then are increasing the number of antennas, the gap becomes smaller and smaller. The red curve becomes closer to the upper bound. So we can say that for a small number of antennas, there is a fairly large loss from channel fading, while we get the smaller and smaller loss the larger M is. And this is something that we call channel hardening. And that means that even if the channel is varying due to the channel fading, when we have a large number of antennas, there is no penalty from the channel fading anymore. And this is a consequence of this spatial diversity 
meaning that even if every element in the channel vector g is varying with Rayleigh fading, when we put all them together and compute the squared norm, the variations become smaller and smaller, and eventually it behaves in the same way as if we would have no fading at all. So the variation the channels are hardening. So in summary, this lecture has been about fading channels and we have been looking at two categories, slow fading and fast fading. In slow fading, we have one realization during our entire transmission. When the transmitter doesn't know the realization of the channel, it has to opportunistically select one rate to communicate that. And then you get an outage probability and one can also define the outage capacity. And we saw that to have a reliable communication, there will be a large performance loss. The lower the outage probability should be, the larger will be the performance loss. The epsilon outage capacity will be much more than the corresponding additive white Gaussian noise channel capacity. But when we have multiple receive antennas, we very quickly get much more reliability. We get the diversity gain and we get the beamforming gain. In the category of fast fading channels, we are seeing many channel realizations during our transmissions. And then we get what's called the ergodic capacity, where the capacity contains an expectation with respect to the channel realization. So we get an averaging over the fading. Even if the transmitter doesn't know the realization of the channel, it can code its transmission based on this average value. And therefore there is no reliability issues anymore, but there is a performance loss compared to a non-fading channel. But once again, having multiple receive antennas can eventually give us similar capacity as with a non-fading channel. That is once again what we call spatial diversity and it's also known as channel hardening as the number of antennas grows very large. So that's the end of lecture number three in multiple antenna communications.